Welcome, it is Wednesday the 3rd of June. Now clearly there's a few things happening today that aren't particularly good news and we'll be looking at those in a minute. But I wanted to start off with a few better news stories first of all. Now you might have just watched the interview I recorded with Craig this morning. Fascinating interview about uh, the situation in Taiwan. So let's start off with the situation in Taiwan and see what we can learn. Now, um, Taiwan has had 443 cases and seven deaths, but it's only, of course, 60 miles across the water from China. So why is it that they've been able to basically completely avoid the pandemic? Because they've had no new cases there. And Craig told us this morning, was it 55 days or 52 days with no new cases at all? So basically, it looks like the infection has been eradicated from Taiwan. Incredibly successful. So they started taking measures early. They were very proactive way back in January. And then they just had excellent basic public health. People that were infected or quarantined complied with the instructions, albeit under threat of punishment, but they did supply. They did, they did comply. And the people there comply with the instructions anyway when they understand them. So basic public health measures and proactivity by their public health officials. And this really makes you wonder if they can manage to do it in Taiwan, why on earth couldn't we manage to do it in the UK? Because we have public health officials as well. In Taiwan, they succeeded. In the UK, they failed. It's quite simple, really. They had great success with basic public health measures. Why didn't we? Open question. But very successful. So Taiwan, absolutely brilliant, well done, excellent. Couldn't be better. You've aborted the epidemic. You've stopped the whole thing from coming in the first place. Good. Now, Vietnam. Now, I've had a few complaints, actually, about people from people in Vietnam saying, Oi, you never mentioned Vietnam. And uh, partly it's because it's difficult to get news on it. But it appears there's been 328 cases. And we don't know how many deaths. I can't find any data. But if it's about 1% as normal, we'd expect three or four deaths in Vietnam. Again, a very successful strategy using basic public health methods. Aggressive testing, mass centralised quarantine programme, curtailed the whole pandemic from the, from the start. So a very successful strategy. So let us, it's probably a bit late now, but in future, let us learn from Taiwan, let us learn from Vietnam. And, you know, really, why didn't our public health people, why didn't our so-called scientific and medical experts manage when the Vietnamese and Taiwanese did? I think that's a question that should be should be uh, asked and answered here. I think there needs to be some kind of accountability for this because there doesn't seem to be at the moment. Now, Japan is a bit interesting. Now, do catch the video we made with uh, Jenny from uh, Tokyo just recently. Very interesting. Uh, limited cases and deaths in Japan, but you kind of get the feeling it's not the whole story. We know that testing, for example, is very difficult to get in Japan. But there again, the Japanese people are very disciplined. And even although they were probably somewhat let down by their government, the, the Japanese people seem to step up to the mark themselves and work out what was required. So whereas in Taiwan and Vietnam, it was from the government down, in Japan, it was more from the people up. So the Japanese government and officials weren't, weren't any more good the, the, than our uh, scientists and officials, as far as I can tell. But uh, the people seem to take much more initiative on their own. But th there is this excellent um, graphic that I found from, from Japan. So um, avoid the three C's. And it's just so simple, like all the best things, it's simple. Close spaces with poor ventilation. And of course, we've been going on and on about ventilation on this in this video. Dilute the viral load. Get the viral load down with good ventilation. So avoid closed spaces, crowded places and closed contact settings. And I like infographics that illustrate those things. And this was interesting. I haven't seen this before, but this Venn diagram shows if you've got three of those all together, you've got a great, much greater chance of starting your own cluster. 
as well as good hygiene measures. So the way that these factors interact with each other, so closed spaces and crowded and close contact settings, for example, you're much more likely to develop your own new cluster. So I thought that was a, I thought that was just a really nice, uh, very simple, but a, a good, a good graphic. Now, um, oh, more new good news. Uh, new Zealand, another dramatically uh, good news story. Virus basically eradicated from New Zealand. I remember umming and ahhing whether this would be possible, and at the time I actually didn't think it would be. But it looks like the Japanese have done it. So limited cases. I think that works out to about 1.4, 1 1.5% 1 uh, death rate in, in New Zealand. But the 12th day now with no new cases and all remaining restrictions within the country look like they're probably going to be lifted next week. Now, obviously, they're not going to start international flights again because that's not within the country. That's outside the country. But domestic restrictions within the country look like they're being lifted. So apart from the international travel, New Zealand is going back to normal because they've avoided the whole thing with good public health measures. And one person is still recovering at home. There's no one in hospital. I hope this person recovers. But dear me, one person in the country who's still recovering at home. So great, remarkably good news story. So there we go. New Zealand, uh, Taiwan and Vietnam shows what can be done. Now, the United States, um, I mean, uh, many of us are just grieving over the situation in the United States at the moment. Uh, we know the numbers are increasing and the deaths are increasing. Now, the, the, the per capita deaths are still lower in the United States than in the UK. But that uh, gap is, is uh, closing somewhat, unfortunately. Now, one thing that's occurred to me is contact tracing trust. So if someone from the government contacts someone who's been in these demonstrations or riots, uh, is the person going to be honest with them? Well, I think clearly it's going to give rise to difficulties. So... I think there's going to be issues of difficulty in contact tracing as a result of the social contact uh, that's gone on in these riots and uh, demonstrations. And of course, we have to demonstrate, we have to differentiate between legitimate demonstrations and completely outrageous rioting. No comparison between the two at all, but both of them capable of causing further transmission of the disease, unfortunately. And there's also a big uh, demonstration in Hyde Park, I think it was in London, in my country at the moment. And I saw, this, I saw the pictures on TV. And to be quite honest, social distancing was not being maintained. It's not good enough. Demonstrate by all means, but you have to do it within the law of social distancing at the moment. If not, there'll be more cases and more deaths. And as we've said, the irony here is that People in ethnic minorities suffer disproportionately. So there's kind of a, a very bitter irony about what's going on in the United States and to a lesser extent in the UK. So I'm sure these people demonstrating in the UK, well, they've got the, there's a legitimate thing to demonstrate about, of course, and they probably feel better about themselves for doing it, but they can infect other people who could die as a result of their demonstrations. Maybe need to be more imaginative at the moment. Demonstrate online or something. Right. Um, the COVID tracker app that I use predicts 173,000 173, people are currently predicted to have symptoms in the UK. So this is so much more than the official, the official testing data. So here's the, the graphic from that app. And th th there we are now, uh, beginning of June. But look at the case. The case, case actually peaked at over two million people having the infection in, in, any one, in, in, in a single day. Um, back in late March, early April, around about the 1st of April. So reporting from symptoms and combining that with testing data is likely to give us these much more uh, accurate 
much more accurate figures. Um, now, that relates to 11,300 new cases per day in the UK as a whole. And the figures for England are between seven and just over 7,000 and just over 9,000. Uh, they can't be too sure about that from the data that they have. But it is down on last week. Just a couple of days ago, that was 9,900. So it is, it's, it's coming down, which is good. 17% uh, down on last week. Now, I've just seen on the news uh, a really quite stirring emotional report from... So it's an elderly care facility in Cheddar, as in Cheddar Cheese and Cheddar Gorge, uh, in Somerset in the UK. And the staff have moved into their care facility and they've stayed there for the last 50 days without going home to their own families. Uh, there were some people sleeping in the stock room and quite a few uh, weeks to go. So they've just moved in, closed off the borders. No patients have died from COVID-19 and they've saved the lives of a lot of their patients because they've been living in the facility for 50 days. They haven't gone home from work for 50 days. That is dedication. That is impressive. So I, I just wanted to publicly acknowledge my admiration for that care team and the brilliant job they've done caring for their residents. Very, very impressive. But it just shows that the people that have died in other care homes all around the world is because of people coming and going. That, that's, that's all it is. This virus only spreads between people. Now, there's a new report. I think it's 86 pages. I, I did look through quite a bit of it this morning. Um, and you, you can read it in the whole tedious document there if, if you want to. Disparities in the risk and outcomes of COVID-19, published by Public Health England. Looking at the disparities, for example, in ethnic minorities and the greater number of people from ethnic minorities that are getting sick and dying from this infection. And nowhere in the entire report did they mention that there might be different levels of immunity between different racial groups. It was all socio-economic, cultural things they were looking at. It's as if they've got an agenda and they want to play to their own agenda. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's as if that were the case. And something blatantly obvious like darker skin producing less vitamin D to promote immunity just wasn't mentioned in the whole document. They didn't even say there is this ludicrous outside chance possibility that there could be a biological factor here related to vitamin D. It wasn't even mentioned. In the meantime, and this is why I feel strongly about it, people are dying. In the meantime. So, glad to see the promoting a document that's promoting their agenda. Pity, I don't think it's going to save any lives. Really quite annoying. You know, even if they just said it was a possibility, you know, why not just screen a few thousand people in the country and find out? And if the data here is the same as in the UK, when we know African Americans have so much lower vitamin D levels than white Americans, that's known, it's a fact. We haven't even bothered to find out here as far as I know. No, never mind trying to account for it. It's, it's I, I don't know, it, it just it looks, I'm stuck for words as you can see. I don't want to say anything that's too, too inflammatory, but uh, I do feel strongly about it because people are getting sick and people are dying and that's, that's what we're about preventing. Now, France has uh, been in increasing deaths over the last 24 hours. Uh, highest daily death toll for 13 days as the lockdown uh, continues to ease. And the fact that the death toll is increasing means that the spread probably increased last month as well. So I think j just a, a vivid reminder that this virus has not gone away. It's still there in France. And Germany kind of illustrates that. Now, Germany has done very well, low number of cases relatively, uh, relatively no, low number of deaths um, compared to, say, the United Kingdom, for example, or Italy or Spain. But Berlin, there's been another 35 cases in the past 24 hours, meaning there's 217 active cases now. Again, way lower than the UK, as we've seen. And that gives an R naught for Germany of about 1.2 to 1.95, which means that the cases will be greatly increasing. 
But the thing is, because the numbers are so small, the R number will fluctuate because the numbers are small, so the percentages are greater. So perhaps not quite as bad as that looks, and I'm, I'm fairly confident the German authorities will get on top of that with basic public health measures. And the Germans have introduced what they call a um, corona traffic light system, which make, makes a lot of sense. So th there's three things. There's the R value, uh, the reproductive rate, uh, the number of uh, free intensive care beds and the number of weekly new infections are the three criteria that they look at for their traffic lights. So that one's gone red, um, in Berlin anyway, not so much the whole country, and those two are still looking pretty good. So, for example, even in Berlin when the cases are higher, uh, last week there was 5.1 cases per 100,000 people. So that's pretty low. And that's in Berlin in the rural areas and other areas in Germany. It's not as high as that. And COVID-19 patients in Germany as a whole... Actually, I'm not sure if that's Germany as a whole or Berlin. I think it might be Germany as a whole. 3.3% um, of intensive care beds have got COVID-19 patients in. So that shows there is capacity there. And the R0 for the country as a whole is R equals about round about 0 0.9, which means the total number of cases in the country will be gradually, albeit very gradually with that, but gradually going down. So a bit of a blip in Berlin there, but optimistic the Germans can, can keep a grip on that and uh, n not, not triggering their three red traffic lights. If the three red traffic lights are triggered, then the Germans have said they will take more stringent lockdown measures. So let's hope the targeted measures that they're taking mean that the more blanket draconian lockdown measures will not be necessary. Now, I'm afraid that's the end of the reasonable news for today. It's not so good after this. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, the numbers don't mean too much. Uh, country with very difficult living conditions in many areas. But in the south of the country, Cox's Bazaar, of course, we have about a million uh, refugees. And uh, the first of the Rohingya refugees uh, died uh, yesterday, I think it was, a uh, 71-year-old man. Uh, died in the camps in Cox's Bazaar. So infection is rising in the camps. There's one million people there living in very difficult circumstances. 29 have tested positive. So there is now spread within the refugee camps around Cox's Bazaar in southern Bangladesh. And the living conditions there mean that this spread will uh, continue. So over the next weeks, we're going to see a lot of people getting uh, the infection in the refugee camps in uh, Cox's Bazaar. And in the weeks after that, proportions of them will, will die. Um, not acceptable, but I don't see anyone's going to intervene to stop it. I just hope they can organise things to, uh, to reduce the spread in the camps by introducing good public health measures. Pessimistic, I'm afraid. Uh, Brazil, yeah, Brazil. Cases increasing. This was the number of deaths in the last 24 hours. President continues to downplay the pandemic, but the scientists and medical experts believe the situation is dire. And this is the word they use, well, whatever the Spanish word for dire is. But that's the word they're using, not my word, the scientists and doctors in Brazil. And they predict the situation is likely to get worse. And that was in a couple of international news outlets. So I believe that to be accurate. And San Paulo and Rio de Janeiro are current epicenters. So unfortunately, many more cases and deaths to come in Bangladesh and Brazil. Uh, Iran. Uh, up to today, 24 hours before, new, new cases. So over 3,000 new cases per day in Iran. Uh, that was the second highest daily increase. So th th we're pretty near the highest daily increases. Um, another 70 deaths. I think these death figures are probably somewhat underreported. But they say they've got 2,500 people in critical condition 
in hospital in Iran at the moment. So I'm afraid the pandemic's got quite a bit further to run in Iran as well. So be braced for more bad news from Iran, I'm afraid. Now, South Africa, very early draconian lockdown, put the lid on things quite successfully. But cases are now starting to increase. Another one and a half thousand in 24 hours as the lockdowns ease, alcohol sales are allowed again. So the lockdown measures worked. It's bought a bit of time, but I'm not quite sure what that time has bought. And it was not possible to keep the poor population locked down for any longer. So again, the health authorities in South Africa are expecting the number of cases in South Africa to, uh, to rise. And I just thought I'd mention that in China, the air pollution levels have returned to normal. Isn't that an appalling indictment they've returned to pre-pandemic levels okay um i think that'll probably do for now i've got some more things to report but uh i'll leave it for now i'm going to show you some pictures there we go this is laura who's a nurse in barcelona who snuck on before it must be said but uh she's managed to get on again uh, with her dog and her husband at the bottom there. Uh, Niels in Denmark. Currently taking his uh, oxygen saturations at 99%. Uh, useful oxygen saturation meter. I've got one of those. It's worth having one of these in the house, I think. it's. Uh, let's have a look see how stressed I am at the moment. Here's mine. How am I doing? Am I going to work? Oh, that's one way you can't see the light very well. Let me have my, my other one. That's a good one, but it doesn't you don't see it in the in the in the daylight so well. Let's try this one. I put me the right way up. <laughs> So my heart rate is currently 76 and my oxygen saturations are currently 90. Make your mind up. 94, 95, that's lowish actually. <laughs> so actually I quite often have lowish oxygen saturations, not quite sure. And it's the same, I've got, we've got more accurate machines at work where I've done this. I do tend to have low oxygen saturations for some reason. But this is accurate. Oh, 98 has changed its mind. Heart rate 74. I just find these things remarkably useful. I mean, they're about $20, these things. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's a good idea to have one in the house. And as you see, I've got two. But there again, I use mine for different purposes. Um, who were we looking at? Oh yeah, there we go. That, uh, it was Niels that started off that discussion. So thank you for watching Niels in uh, Denmark. Uh, this is Una who watches in California. Good to know you're watching in California, Una. Thank you for watching. Uh, uh, now, these ladies watch in Oregon, but I'm afraid I've forgotten to write your names down. So please accept my apologies in lieu of names. But good to know you're watching. Uh, this is Pam, who's an actress actually in California. So uh, if you're a film producer watching, do uh, give Pam a role. I'm sure she'd tolerate some Hollywood blockbuster or something. But thank you, Pam, for that picture. And thank you for watching in... California. Uh, this is Patricia and Bill, also in California. Seem to be a bit California focused today for some reason, but thank you for watching, Patricia and uh, Bill. Uh, this is Patty, who also has a dog similar to mine uh, in uh, Minnesota. In Minnesota. Thank you for watching in Minnesota, Patty. My dog, of course, Winston, the black dog, symbolises depression. So that's that's what Winston does. Winston Churchill's black dog. Uh, this is Paul in Oman, 
which is just south of Dubai, just east of Yemen, if I am correct in my geography. But thank you for watching, Paul, in uh, Amman. Uh, this is Ralph, and I think Ralph's in England somewhere, but I'm not exactly sure where, and he seems to have snuck on twice. <laughs>